primary function our primary function is capturing and highlighting the healthcare stories of everyday Floridians. Uh, and I'm really excited that I get to share some of that work with you all. Uh, today we'll talk through why storytelling is so important, uh, why it's effective, how to tell a good story, and then we'll explore some of the places where, yeah, storytelling can be useful. Uh, but yeah, as we kind of start our journey here together, we'll try to unpack why storytelling is such a big deal at all. Uh, I'll start off by quoting a great thinker in this space, my friend, Ralph, the anthropologist. He looks like an anthropologist, I'm sure. Um, you know, in the years he was going to school, among all the, the nonsense he would say to me uh, about his chosen field, most of which I ignored all the time, uh, there was this little nugget of truth in there. And it was that storytelling is central to our human existence, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but here we are now, and it turns out that Ralph was right. Don't tell him I said that. Uh, but yeah, telling stories is something that every one of us does and very likely uh, have done recently. You know, key to understanding, I think, the value of stories is understanding why we as humans tell stories at all. And for you all here with me now, uh, I just want you to, for a second, think about a recent story that you've told someone. Just call it to mind if you can. For me, uh, as part of the work that I get to do as Voices, uh, we've been talking a lot recently about the struggles of health access in rural Florida, uh, where we've had a number of hospitals close in the last couple of years. And you know, while we have like a lot of data points that help us paint the picture of what's going on in these communities, I almost always lead with uh, the experience I had with my wife. Uh, at Shans just a couple months ago. Uh, 11 months ago, my wife did the hard thing and gave birth to our first kid, uh, our daughter. Uh, the hard part about it was that it took two days to be admitted into Shans, even though we live 15 minutes from it, it took us two days to get admitted because there was such a long list of people waiting to be induced. That long list is a direct result of all the hospitals that have closed in the surrounding counties, right? We lost a hospital in Suwannee, in Columbia, in Bradford, all since 2020. Uh, and yeah, now it's created the situation where we felt it. And anytime I go into places to, to talk about these rural hospital closures, I always start there. Now, I definitely tell that story because I hope, you know, to get people as outraged as I was at three o'clock in the morning when they're telling me we can't come in yet. Uh, but I... I guess I fundamentally tell it so that whoever's listening ends up in the same emotional place that I was, but certainly the same emotional place as the folks who currently have to drive 90 minutes to two hours to deliver a baby or to find any kind of hospital uh, for you know whatever their issues are. Now, for the story that you all are thinking about, uh, the story you might have told recently, yeah, how did the listener react? Did it bring whoever you were telling it to? Did it bring them to the same emotional place that you were in, very likely it did. Uh, was it the reaction you were hoping for? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It kind of depends on who you're talking uh, talking to. But I think that's fundamentally the point of stories. It's an attempt to bring people to that same emotional place that you're in. Another question, uh, you know, have you ever had someone, a friend, come to you asking for advice on a situation? maybe because you've been there before uh, or have a specific perspective on it. Uh, you know, I ask that because I think it's a position that we've all been in. Someone comes to us for advice and maybe you've noticed it or, you know, maybe not, but usually a lot of times we'll answer questions like that. We'll answer the need for advice with a story of our own. Uh, whenever people come to me and they're like, hey, Scott, should I apply to law school? I roll my eyes uh, and depending on if they're like a good human being uh, is usually what like my advice hinges on. But I usually then follow up with my own stories, my own experiences of it, what I got from it and why I think it was an important step for me to take. Uh, but yeah, that's fun. That's just another example of where and how we use stories. It's to help guide other people. Uh, so yeah, sometimes I think Something about hearing stories, right, helps us to create a firmer picture in our mind that ultimately helps us to connect to the subject and people emotion emotionally. It's the difference between reading a box score. If you're into sports, uh, 
you see a box score or you see a headline in the morning and you see the two teams played a really close game and you're like, oh, okay, cool. That was interesting. Versus someone kind of recounting to you, my poor wife has to listen to this all the time. Someone recounting to you the nitty gritty of what happened in the last three minutes of a game to really draw you into the drama of the moment. Uh, but like we saw with the advice question, Stories also help us illustrate our values, right? Meaning those things that we prioritize and how we make decisions based off of those different factors. So, you know, knowing why we tell stories generally as human beings also starts to help us understand why stories are such a big deal in the context of advocacy and systems change work, but I think also as a part of health education. Uh, you know, the point of our advocacy is moving leaders and decision makers to take uh, specific, to make specific decisions and to take specific actions. In the same way with health education, we're hoping to, you know, move people to, to change certain behaviors or to proactively pursue something. Storytelling, like we saw, connects people uh, to things emotionally. It plays on those values. And at the very least, it can inform decisions uh, that people ultimately make. And that's why when it comes to advocacy and to education, storytelling is a really effective tool in moving others to act. It's product and well-care, which is... Oh. Uh, but it's worth further exploring the question of how stories serve as a catalyst for action. Uh, and believe it or not, there is actually a science behind it. You know, what we know about the world is that it's made up in many ways, it's just pure chaos, right? It's a lot of individual actors with unique histories and perspectives, making individual choices about which actions to take. And even when that choice is to do nothing uh, or to let others decide uh, and actually uh, But anytime someone makes a decision about which action to take, that action is usually made up of two components. First, you know, human beings, I think, tend to think through the how of that potential action. Is it something that's feasible to do? What's required of me? And do I have the things I need to, to like, get it done? And even when we attempt really hard and nearly impossible things, we take them on partly because we think that, that there's at least a path to try. Like, there's at least something we can attempt to do that might get at, uh, yeah, the action. But I think what pushes us to try the thing in the first place and why we continue to, to pursue things, even when they're difficult, it's our why, our emotional motivation. You know, whether it's driven by something we believe in or it's an aspiration to be great or a desire to accomplish something specific, our why is usually the spark for that action. You know, uh, think for a second about all the things you might know how to do or even have the power to do, but you don't because it just doesn't mean that much to you. So every action, yes, is informed by the practical question of how to do it, but also the why. Uh, emotion without a strategy often doesn't lead anywhere, but having the best strategy in the world doesn't matter if we're not motivated to implement it. In the context of policy advocacy, uh, you know, which is relevant to us as voices, uh, we often have that how figured out, right? Like we know the processes of government and we often have a specific bill that we're pushing uh, to implement the solutions that we want to see done. What's often missing for us is that people we, the people we hope to persuade usually don't have that motivation or a why that currently outweighs their, that outweighs their current why for just staying in their current position or in the status quo. And that's why without, you know, without a doubt, the hardest roadblock uh, is getting over that that why piece. But I will say that recognizing that that's the work in front of you, uh, recognizing that it's that motivational piece is half the battle. And stories we've learned and we've seen in our work is really one of the best hopes we have at overcoming that stagnation, overcoming that, you know, fear of changing the status quo. But how exactly do stories impact our personal lives? Stories, like we heard earlier, really move us to action by engaging our emotions. Um, when you think about it, you realize that our emotions actually tell us what we value in the world. When we hear stories that make us feel a certain way, those feelings tend to echo 
our core values. As an example, right? If I told you all that, if I told you a story about a woman who worked the exact same hours as her male counterpart in the exact same job, but like the average woman in 2022 was earning only 82% of what a man in the same position earned. Uh, how would you all feel, right? And I can't see or hear your reactions, but I hope that the resulting feeling is rage. Uh, but if you dig into that feeling, if you dig into that thing that's so upsetting, you realize that you're, you know, the facts of the story offend you probably because of your fundamental belief and value that people should be paid equally for equal work. Uh, we all have that underlying value system, our system of belief, or I'm sorry, guys, this is one of the many bad jokes laced in this presentation, or as Bunk Moreland from The Wire puts it, everybody has a code. Now, usually if something hits us, uh, you know, hits us to our core values like that, we look to do or say something about it. In the area of policy advocacy, we're usually engaging with leaders and decision makers. So they're in public service. So, you know, if you fight back that cynicism that might creep up as you think about legislators, uh, it's fair to assume that one of their general values is that it's important to get involved, right? Like the fact that they're in public service would suggest that their value system is that it's important to get involved and to take action when there's an opportunity to do so. So playing on that value and other values is, you know, that your issue tends to evoke is how you nudge people from stagnation into action. Here's kind of another illustration of that idea. I think this graphic is helpful because it, I think it highlights some of the, the really specific things that keep people and our leaders uh, from acting sometimes, whether that's inertia, you know, the general idea that it's easier to do nothing or apathy, uh, just a lack of, and yeah, apathy, a lack of interest, generally because you think something doesn't relate to you or impact you at all. Uh, there's also fear, uh, the fear to act, uh, mostly because, right, doing something might rock the boat, or we think it's not popular, even though it's the right thing to do. Uh, and sometimes that connects to the feeling of isolation. It's hard to act if you feel like you're out on an island, even if it's the right thing to do. And to that point, self-doubt can easily creep in and keep us from taking whatever action is in front of us. But stories have the potential to spark a bigger emotion that hopefully overtakes the thing that's keeping us in that uh, keeping us in that phase of stagnation. You know, if you have a sense of what's holding your target audience back, so for you all, as you do health education work or advocacy, whatever that works that work looks like. If you have a sense of what's holding your target audience back, stories can be framed and told to counteract those specific emotions. You know, stories of impacted individuals um, can stress urgency. They can drive emotional connections uh, to move people from apathy to anger. They can give people hope of what might come from their action. Uh, it can inform people that they actually stand with a broader community of people. And yeah, that there are people who stand with them, that ultimately they won't be alone. Uh, and stories can inspire people to recognize and own their own power to act. So it's in all of these ways that stories can influence and move people out of the act of, move people to act, uh, making it critical to advocacy and education, especially on behalf and to the most vulnerable populations. Now, if you've hung in this long, uh, hopefully I've convinced you of the importance of stories. Uh, but it's also true that not all stories are created equal and that there's an art to telling stories uh, that are more compelling and ultimately move the needle. Now, I've never seen this show, but one of, the, one of my tips is that any story you tell shouldn't take years to communicate. I hope that doesn't offend any How I Met Your Mother fans here. Uh, but I, I will say that all good stories have a common structure and a couple of main components. There's the plot, which, you know, generally refers to the entire sequence of events in a story. Uh, generally, something happens to a character, and then the character needs to make a choice, and then that choice yields an outcome that ultimately teaches a moral. Uh, but it definitely starts with that main character, who we get to know with some quick facts uh, that situate us in that story. It's not every fact about a person. It's just the ones that really lock us into 
the relevancy that it has to our audience, right? So for us as health advocates, we talk a lot about people in the coverage gap, people who are working but don't have access to Medicaid or coverage in the ACA marketplace. So we'll talk about, you know, a single parent who's working hard at a retail job, but only makes $25,000 a year. Now, the story from there should pretty immediately introduce us to a challenge that the hero of our story faces. How we talk about that challenge should set up how we talk about the ultimate solution. So instead of all of the challenges that, you know, the single parent faces, we would focus on how the limited income and unaffordable options for healthcare coverage is holding her back from realizing her full potential or doing all the things uh, the single parent wants to. But at the same time, uh, but at the, at the point of that challenge, right, our hero should be uh, forced to make a decision. Uh, so for our single parent, that choice would likely reflect how desperate of a situation that person's in. Uh, maybe they have to make the decision to go without care, right? Even though that's not a, it's not a real choice, but it's a decision, right? Uh, it's worth noting, I will say, kind of like that example points out that Often for the people we talk about as part of our advocacy, there's no real choice uh, and people just remain in difficult situations. And yeah, just to say that as we sit here and highlight a decision that someone has to make, sometimes there is no real decision and that's the story itself. So what happens to our hero after making that decision or just being absolutely stuck? What does life look for them now? And finally, like every story we've enjoyed as kids, there should be a summary of the values that the story is meant to evoke. Uh, so working people, single parents, vulnerable people shouldn't have to make impossible choices to survive. Something needs to change to protect them is generally, you know, the arc of the stories that we tell. So taking a step back from the technical components of any of a story, right? Uh, just to note that any good story and any well-told story should first create an emotional connection with the listener, uh, you know, for the listener to the subject of the story itself. It should also be informational in that it teaches the listener something about the world and how people are experiencing it. And finally, you know, though it's not totally in your control, the story should hopefully transform the listener in some way. This doesn't have to be a huge transformation and frankly, it rarely is, right? It doesn't, I think most good stories will actually just plant a little seed in the person's mind or just open the door to a new way of thinking, even just the crack, uh, primarily by playing on those values. And yeah, you just kind of hope that it grows from there, that all the other things that the person is experiencing, all of the, the things they might have in their own history or perspective would start to connect with the story you told. Uh, I think sometimes we feel, you feel the pressure of sharing that story, right? Like you really want it to land, you want it to stick and move the person to immediately take up whatever it is you're trying to get them to, to buy into. Uh, but I don't think, yeah, sometimes it happens, but more often it's just the little impact, the little seed that like grows over time and hopefully brings that person around. As you tell stories, there are a couple of things to avoid. Uh, the sum of this advice, I think all of these things, uh, really just boils down to how do you share a story quickly, right? Like you tell a specific story, you tell it with the fine points, but you try not to overwhelm whoever's listening with a lot of things that maybe aren't relevant to the main point you're trying to make. I think it all boils down to telling as succinct a story, as relevant a story as possible. But like we learned from Anansi the Spider, uh, or, you know, for people who read Anansi the Spider or, uh, you know, watch the Wishbone episode about it, uh, we can use stories in many different ways. Uh, but in advocacy, for us, there are really two settings that we uh, use stories in, besides convincing decision makers on certain issues. And I feel like maybe relevant to the work that you all do. Uh, you know, within our, our own communities and coalitions, I think there's always a need for leadership, a need to keep people on the same page as we move towards a common goal. Stories are a really effective tool in the arsenal of any leader, especially those who are facing pushback, right, from people who are unmotivated 
uh, to move in your direction. Uh, President Lincoln, I think, is maybe the best example of this as a powerful storyteller in the context of leadership. Uh, he was born on the frontier uh, where stories were really used as a way to entertain people. Uh, but he learned from his dad, who was big on learning early, uh, how to tell stories. And he would practice by telling kids his age stories. I think he'd just like stand on a stump somewhere and just, yeah, tell people stories as they go. Maybe the, the relevant bit here is that it's also worth practicing. Like it's telling stories, telling them well, uh, really, you know, if it's your personal story and maybe you've told it a couple of times, then you feel really well versed in that thing. But as you're sharing the stories of others, as you're encouraging others to share their stories, uh, just to emphasize the need to kind of rehearse it to an extent, to practice it, to really lock it in. Uh, it's just one of those things that helps you to tell a really succinct story and a powerful story at the same time. Stories can also be used to drive public narratives and campaigns when framed the right way. Uh, when we tell stories that put others in our shoes, uh, you know, or in the shoes of an impacted person, including, you know, the challenges, the choices, and the outcomes that we've gone through or seen, that's our story of self. But when we include language that also reflects the implications of that challenge on the broader society and what it might mean for the rest of us, that's the story of us. And then finally, when you are able to, to couch that story and hit on the values, right, and let others know why this matters to them and why uh, they should act, take a specific action, that's the story of now. And so to add this, to put this in kind of like a practical sense, right, that as you're communicating out to people, maybe it's part of a larger education campaign, I think hitting on messages that as part of that singular campaign, hit on all three of these frames is a great way to engage people in what you're doing, right? You have not just whatever personal story is at the heart of it, but you also frame that story in, hey, this is kind of a community issue and you have a role to play in it. I think is an important, important things to add as we look to, to like use stories to actually get towards outcomes. Uh, and finally, just a quick note and some encouragement for you to use stories in whatever setting feels right. It's, yeah, not just in the context for us uh, being legislators, but also clients and patients, colleagues, uh, donors, even uh, family, friends, and any media work you might do. Just to say, there's always a role and a place for stories. But at this point, I'm sure it all feels pretty theoretical. Uh, but I promise that telling stories is something that works. And three examples. Uh, the first two are more related to the advocacy work that we do as Florida Voices. But I think the last one is really relevant to uh, just health education and the impact it can have there. Uh, but to start off, in 2014, a pretty hostile political climate, uh, Florida did what was at the time unthinkable. You know, just a few short years after debating and almost passing a bill that would have allowed the profiling of anyone suspected of being undocumented, the legislature actually moved instead to support this community of Floridians. Uh, and this is actually a story that's like uh, courtesy of one of our great partners, Karen Woodall at the Florida People's Advocacy Center. Uh, but yeah, years before passing in 2014, she worked with a group of students who met with Representative Steve Rutherford uh, on this issue. Uh, they went to his office and they shared, you know, their story. It was her and a group of students who I believe were also undocumented. Uh, they shared their stories of working hard and uh, working hard to get into college, but how the high costs, sometimes three to four times more, kept them from, you know, getting this experience that they worked so hard to learn. And since he wasn't speaker at the time, uh, Representative Weatherford explained that he really had no power on the issue, but that if he ever had the chance to advance the issue, he would do it. Uh, and then that chance came in 2014, and he remained committed to making this happen. He even wrote this op-ed for the Tampa Bay Times, where he shared about how much meeting with the students and hearing their stories impacted him. Uh, the most telling in the op-ed is how he had connected to those stories he heard, or how he connected those stories he heard with his own personal story when considering his ancestors and likely those experiences uh, he had, they had in pursuit of an education and a good life. So yeah, just 
really that idea of planting a seed and over time watching that thing grow and banking on that story just being in the person's consciousness. But yeah, sometimes, you know, that change can come from a devastating story too, right? Uh, we do a lot of work in the oral health space and the story of Diamante Driver is one that comes up quite a bit. Uh, Diamante was a 12 year old who needed a simple tooth extraction. And because it was so hard to find a Medicaid provider, he went without care. Bacteria from the abscess in his tooth had actually spread to his brain by the time he ever received medical attention uh, for the toothache and unfortunately later passed. Uh, his death exposed what was a disjointed dental care program in, uh, in Maryland, actually. Thousands of Maryland children weren't being connected with Medicaid-sponsored dentists, uh, and those dentists were receiving little reimbursements for treating Medicaid patients, something that we actually are battling right now here in Florida. Uh, but a few years later, Maryland was, after this happened, uh, it only took a matter, it was just a matter of time, just a couple of years before Maryland was actually making great strides in improving their Medicaid programs and their reimbursement rates. Uh, it's still by no means perfect, but there was a lot of progress. Uh, Harry Goodman, who's the director of oral health at the Maryland Department of Health, uh, he made it clear that it was Diamante's story that spurred the change that needed to happen. And finally, as we think about health education, uh, this is something that we don't get to do a whole lot as voices and actually only recently learned about from our great partners at the Rural Health Women's Project. Uh, but they use this tool called Foto Novelas. Um, they're similar in format to a comic book. Uh, however, instead of illustrations, they use sequential photographs that are accompanied by dialogue bubbles, right? Um, photo novelas are typically, or they typically depict a simple but dramatic story or soap opera uh, that's enveloped in a dramatic plot, but ultimately contains a moral message, right? So all of the components that we've talked about. Uh, the reason they're so effective is that they, it's created by the community. They work really closely with the community that the photo novela is meant to target. They use actors from the community. They test the language with, you know, people from those specific communities. Uh, and yeah, they really work collaboratively to build these tools. And if you go on their website, uh, I think it's linked in this presentation, which I'm happy to share afterward, but you can see all the different ways they, they talk about these issues. And they're really heavy topics, right? Like you think about the stigma that comes with HIV AIDS and what that's meant for people who, yeah, don't get the care that they need, uh, don't get the support that they need. To be able to see in these uh, photo novelas, to be able to, to see yourself, people who look like you, people who are speaking your language uh, and communicate in this way can be really impactful and really powerful. And I think this is a model that they've been using for 30 years. Uh, so just to say that if you don't know, if maybe this is the first time you're hearing about it, I would really encourage you to check it out and see their whole library of these photo novelas. Uh, I think currently they use them to both encourage health behaviors, uh, to teach steps towards you know making positive choices. Uh, they reinforce clinical recommendations. They kick off discussion among groups uh, at different meetings. And they encourage self-identification of risk factors and just generally raise awareness. So I can't say enough about how powerful of a tool this is, uh, particularly as a, a vehicle for sharing stories. And finally, I'll say that, you know, storytelling can feel like a big thing. It can feel like it requires a, a lot of work, but it's something each of us can do and probably does already. Uh, you don't have to be part of an organization you can just be yourself uh, and use your story in whatever setting feels appropriate. Uh, even if you're a provider, I think one of the, the thing about stories is like, sometimes it can feel like the, the stories that are most important and they're very important are those, are the stories of those who are impacted, right? People who are experiencing the system in one way or another for themselves. But for those of us who might be educators or providers or just advocates, I'll say that your perspective on these things matters as well uh, and is an important story to tell. Uh, often, right, like people who are being directly impacted by some of these systems don't have the space or time or language to, to show up 
right in front of decision makers or to do whatever it is, but you can speak from your perspective on their behalf for it to shine light on what's happening with them. So just to say that everyone has a story to tell and all of those stories have value. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to use them. We produce videos and things like that because we're an organization, right? But if it's just you, you can do a letter to the editor. You can write an op-ed. Uh, you can put together your own version of a photo novella. There are just a lot of things. Uh, yeah, a lot of options at your disposal. So with that, I'll thank you all for taking the time to hear me out. Uh, here's a little redemption for anyone who is a uh, How I Met Your Mother fan. Uh, but yeah, really just appreciate you all taking the time to hear me out. Any questions? That's okay. Yeah, that's really okay. All right, um, thank you so much, Scott. I just wanna let everyone know we did record this presentation and it will be available on the Florida Literacy Coalition website um, within the next probably week. Awesome. If it's okay, I'd love to hear from you all, just like the types of the type of work you do and if and when stories might be relevant or helpful in the, yeah, just kind of some of the outreach that you guys do. Hi, I'm Terry. I work at um, Florida State University College of Medicine and I, I'm a librarian and I teach the med students there. And I do tell stories when I'm teaching them, giving them analogies of different things. And once upon a time, FSU had a storytelling class that I took, which was pretty awesome, but I love stories and I enjoyed your presentation very much. Awesome, Terry. No, that's really great to hear. And we've been doing a lot of work with different med students across the state and yeah, there's, I'll say like an interest in advocacy work more broadly. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really great to hear that you're like doing that work in that space and sharing stories as a part of it. Um, yeah, just find it really powerful. Cool. Good morning. My name is Shay Smith. Um, I work as a women's health nurse practitioner in the DON at a uh, health department. I don't get to share stories often, but when I work in the teen clinic, um, I have a little bit more time to work with them. So I tell them stories um, just about birth control and life and STDs. It's part of the uh, education. And Shay, I imagine you see, just in your role, you, you maybe encounter a lot of, or see people who are encountering a lot of like barriers to care, right? Is that fair Correct. to say? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever done advocacy work in the past, but, you know, maybe this is my general encouragement. Uh, it's folks like you who I think sit in this really unique position, right? You sit in the middle where you both communicate to with people who are using these systems, but also maybe have the language and stuff like that, the, the availability uh, almost uh, to like communicate that back out to like the people who need to hear it, who need to understand how people are living day to day. So, yeah. Really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Where can I um, go to learn more about um, advocating in Florida besides your your company? So yeah, well, shamelessly, I will say, please feel free to reach out to Florida Voices for Health. Uh, it's a good reminder because I left this last uh, slide out. Uh, yeah, if you do want to get a hold of us just to learn about the work that we're doing, uh, visit us at healthyfla.org or Scott at, or just, yeah, just shoot me an email directly at scott at healthyfla.org. Uh, we, you know, we're in legislative session right now. Uh, it goes on for just like another week or two. And for the first five or six, week of, six weeks of session, we were bringing teams of people up to Tallahassee just to meet with their legislators. Uh, we help them travel. We help, you know, cover hotel rooms and stuff like that. Uh, we give people a place to stay and stuff to eat. We schedule meetings and just, yeah, spend a whole day walking up and down the Capitol, meeting with folks, talking about our different issues, but also whatever issues people bring to us that they care the most about. So if that work feels interesting, if there are the things that you're seeing in your work where you're like, hey, someone's got to do something about this, uh, feel free to reach out because uh, that's the work that we do is giving you all the tools to 
take up some of that advocacy, but also giving you a community of people who will stand with you in meetings and yeah, just show up in numbers for you um, as we work on all the things that need work. Thank you. I'll be reaching out. Awesome. Look forward to it. Cool.